Did you guys go to Merlin and download the um, uh, syllabus, the, the lecture for this? Did anybody do it? No? Okay. You could. You don't have to. I'm just wondering. Show me your hands. Raise your hands. Who went to Merlin and actually downloaded this talk? A couple of people, a handful of people. A few days ago, it wasn't there. Yeah, I put it there, like, well, probably late Monday night. These holiday weekends really slow me down. Um, they didn't used to, but they do now. So we're going to talk now about the ultrasound of the bowel and then move into the gallbladder. And normally when you talk about ultrasound of the bowel, people go, what? You know, there's air in the bowel. Air is the enemy of ultrasound. You can't use ultrasound for the bowel. But actually, there's a lot of things you can see with ultrasound of the intestines. And so we're going to be talking about some of that stuff uh, right now. But first of all, what you need to learn is how to overcome the enemy of ultrasound, which is the bowel gas. And, and, and sometimes it's pretty significant how much bowel gas there is. So for this gentleman here, you know, that's a lot of air going on in there probably. And, you know, no matter what you do, you may not be able to do an ultrasound on certain extreme ends of the body habitus spectrum. Okay, and that's just, that, that's just a limitation of, of ultrasound sometimes. But most of the time, the majority of the time, patients don't have this body habitus, and you can get, get into their abdominal uh, areas with ultrasound. So you can look at where the gas is. If it's in the lumen or inside the center of the bowel, that's normal. Those are all future farts. That's what we expect to see. If there's air in the wall of the bowel, that's always abnormal, and that means that patient's usually very sick. So intramural means wall, in the wall of the bowel, the mural. You'll see these words luminal and mural all over medicine. And then there's bowel obstructions. We can see that appendicitis and um, sometimes even free air. So when you look at the uh, bowel intestines with ultrasound, you would like to use, the like everywhere else in the body, you want to try to use the highest possible frequency so you get the best possible resolution as long as you can penetrate to the depth of interest. And so usually on most patients with the bowel, like for the appendicitis and stuff, we use this linear probe. That gets us our answer almost all the time, which is great because it's high frequency. Though occasionally we got to use the lower frequency, in this case the curvilinear probe, down in that you know three megahertz range if we have to. Um, in a larger patient, we have to turn to this transducer sometimes, but almost always I can get by if I push hard enough with the linear transducer. We get really nice images. And what we do is this technique called mowing the lawn, where you start in the riper quadrant and you can see sort of where the ascending colon is there. The ascending colon is always in the riper quadrant. It's got haustra, and you guys have had this in anatomy now, I think, haustra versus the plique circularis that you see with the small bowel. Right. And so you can identify that sometimes on ultrasound when it's filled with fluid. Now if there's air in the, um, in, in the colon and the small bowel, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to see. You have to do a really, diff really sort of um, active compression of the intestine in order to see the walls. But when there's fluid there, which is especially true in disease states, then we can see the haustra versus the, the plique very easily. Anyway, so you, you sort of that follow that ascending colon down to the right lower quadrant, and that's where you, that you expect to see the cecum with this blind-ended loop there, which brings you to the terminal ilium um, where the appendix juts off of. And then um, once you're at the appendix, then you can kind of go back up the ascending colon and then go across the transverse down the descending portion of the colon. You know, you'll see the sigmoid down in the pelvis and the rectum, if you want to see that, very easy to see almost always. It's right behind a nice fluid-filled bladder. Um, and then, again, to try to differentiate small bowel from large bowel, difficult to do with air-filled loops of bowel in normal individuals, but when the patients have disease states, then you can really make out the uh, plique circularis. I'll show you some examples of that. This is normal intestine. This is what we expect to see, sort of a layered appearance. It's easily compressible. So anybody in this room, including the models uh, this afternoon, you'll see you compress on those loops of bowel. They just squirt closed and no problem. They're, they peristalse every you know, 10, 20 seconds. You'll see peristalsis roll through, and, um, and that's normal. And sometimes with disease states of the bowel, you could see hyperperistalsis initially, and then eventually a peristalsis or no movement at all of the bowel. Uh, large intestine has wall thickness up to four millimeters. Small intestine is less than that. Everybody argues about the exact numbers for small intestine, but really it's somewhere between three and four millimeters for um, small intestine. Okay. So if you ever have wall thickness greater than four millimeters, no matter what you're looking at, 
that's an abnormal disease state of that particular bowel, whether it's colitis or something else. Um, you just measure the wall. And this is what abnormal intestine looks like. If you see this picture on the top here, the wall starts on this outer rim here and extends down until you get to the lumen of the bowel. And uh, this is where the air and fecal contents reside here in the lumen. And the wall extends all the way down until you reach something that looks like lumen that's usually air that does that. And that's how you can define where to measure the bowel. So it's from the outer wall down to where the air starts. And again, in normal individuals, less than four millimeters is the norm. Now, the other thing that happens when you have abnormal bowel is that you get that loss of the layered appearance. So everything kind of starts to, to get stuck together. You get things that get tacked down to one another and they no longer slide and slip easily amongst each other. So in normal individuals, when you compress the bowel, they're all slipping, sliding, it's called the sliding organ sign. They slide all amongst one another um, in the peritoneal cavity. And when you have abnormal intestine, you lose that sliding, that layered appearance, and you lose the compressibility. In fact, abnormal bowel, specifically when you're talking about appendicitis, it's a non-compressible tubular structure, and that's how you define it. The other thing that happens is sometimes you get some perienteric fat around the... Um, the rim of the of the intestine when there's inflammation going on. So in this patient down here that has pseudomembranous colitis, we can see this this hyperechoic area here, and also adjacent over here. It may look a little subtle to you right now as you're sitting here looking up at these images, but I can tell you when in real time that when you go to compress this, you know all this stuff kind of gets tacked down together. This peri uh, enteric fat, this hyperechoic area, and it all moves together. Not unlike the way patients with cellulitis with skin infections you see all this hyperechoic islands there that you're going to learn about pretty soon that, uh, that we call cobblestoning. And so whenever there's anywhere in the body with ultrasound, whenever there's inflammation, it appears as hyperechoic areas. That's how inflamed tissue looks. Now to overcome this enemy of ultrasound, one thing you can do is take the patient, have them take their right leg, put it over their left leg as far as possible without falling off the table. And that helps to kind of compartmentalize all their intestines a little bit more anteriorly. So when you go to compress, um, you get better sort of um, angle of compression on the bowel. They don't slip out of the way as much. So you can really get some good compression going on there. I, I think that sort of helps in this, in this process. At least that's a little tip or trick that a sonographer once taught me. I don't know exactly why that works so well, but it seems to help. And the other thing is you're going to push pretty hard to compress these loops, harder than you would imagine. Now, the group in the last session on Tuesday was asking me, now, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, how hard do we really need to push? It seems like that would be uncomfortable to the patient. That kind of goes against our, our teaching as doctors. And that's why we have um, medications, these narcotics, when we do this, like fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very short-acting narcotic, lasts about 20 minutes. If I have a patient who comes in with a lot of abdominal discomfort that I'm going to do an ultrasound on, for me to be successful in being able to compress their belly in somebody who's got a lot of pain, I need to give them analgesics, pain medication, as I do this. And so a good one is fentanyl because it goes on and then it goes off right away. It doesn't hang around for a few hours. It's completely gone in 20 minutes. And so, um, so we use that a lot, actually. So I go to the room with the nurse and say, okay, you push the fentanyl, I'll start the ultrasound because it starts working almost immediately when you push it. Um, and then you'll see, sometimes you have to use two hands to do this compression. And again, I keep coming back to this. When you have a disease state, that reduces the amount of peristalsis, there's more, there's more bowel wall thickening, and there's less intraluminal gas, and all of this makes it easier to visualize the intestinal contents. Okay, now, this is what it looks like when you have air in the wall of the bowel. This is a patient who has... Um, a very sick bowel, we call it sometimes. It's, it's got a disease state to it, and there's air out in the bowel from infection. And this is what it looks like when you have something like necrotizing enterocolitis. You get air in the wall of the bowel, intramural air. It looks like little punctate areas here, and sometimes we can see comet tails. I don't see any comet tails here. Sometimes, oh, here's one. That looks like, a, yeah, that's totally a comet tail right there. You can see this little comet tail coming down. And a comet tail is a reverberation artifact that goes towards the bottom of the screen, and you see that with air, and sometimes metal, but air classically causes these comet tails. Here's an example of a mixed picture. We see intraluminal gas, which is normal. Everybody in this room right now who's ever had a fart has intraluminal gas. That's normal to see that. We'll see that all over the models today, hopefully. 
And then in the wall, we can make out these punctate areas out here in the wall. And in fact, I can tell there's another problem here. If I measure from the lumen out to the edge of this wall right here, I guarantee you this is more than four millimeters. This looks just eyeballing it. It looks like almost a centimeter thickness. So we know that this is a disease state here. And indeed, this patient's got um, air in the wall of their bowel. And just another example of a patient with necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, we can see all these punctate lesions here, with some with some shadows. Now, people always ask me, does, does air cause dark shadows or bright shadows? It causes both. Sometimes it causes dark shadows. Sometimes it causes bright shadows. There's a term for this that we use sometimes in medicine. It's called dirty shadows. Dirty shadows is when um, air comes from the bowel. And so whenever you have air coming from the bowel, it's termed dirty shadows, kind of a... Uh, because it's coming from where all the poop is. And so that's why people call it that, I think. But, um, but we can see here the total comet tail right here coming from the wall of this bowel, um, including up here, this is all air in the wall of the bowel. Another example here of intramural gas. This is a loop of intestine seen in a bunch of fluid. This patient has ascites, so their liver stopped working. They couldn't make the proteins. The liver couldn't make the proteins anymore. It keeps the blood, keeps the oncotic pressure high inside that intra vascular space and so the fluid seeps out into the third space or into the peritoneal cavity surrounding organs like the intestines. It actually makes the intestines really easy to see. And this, this patient was really sick. They had um, some colitis here and this thickened um, bowel wall plus this air in the wall of the bowel told us that this patient... Uh... Now, small bowel obstructions, you typically think about, you know, in medicine we say the patient's got a small bowel obstruction get an x-ray and you'll see it on the x-ray. Unfortunately, an x-ray needs to see an air fluid level. So in the patient who's sitting upright, when they get the x-rays of the abdomen, if they don't have air and fluid together in the intestines, you will miss this diagnosis on an x-ray. That's why x-rays have terrible test characteristics to pick up a small bowel obstruction. Only in the very severe cases do we usually see it. But even then, sometimes um, we miss it. So because when you've got a closed loop where you've got bowel that's been twisted on both sides, and so it's the loop in the middle that's obstructed on both ends, okay, this, this can happen a lot. There's no air in that intra, in between the two ends that are twisted, that's called the closed loop obstruction. Those you classically miss on x-ray. Or very proximal bowel obstruction where somebody's vomiting a lot, they vomit all the air, and now there's just fluid in there, and you don't see those either. Ultrasound is really good at picking up both these. In fact, it's got much better test characteristics than an x-ray has. Not as good a CT scan, um, but at the bedside, we can get the diagnosis of bowel obstruction pretty easily. What we see initially are hyperperistaltic, dilated, and fluid-filled small bowel loops that we directly visualize with ultrasound, uh, evidenced by their uh, plicae circularis, and that tells us that this is indeed a small bowel. And I'm waiting for the loop to come around on the video so I can pause it and back it up so you guys can see what the plicae look like. See how these... these uh, you can make out these, that small bowel that looks like that. And in fact, this patient had such a bad small bowel obstruction, there was perforation, and the fluid leaked out in between these loops of bowel. So fluid being black, always black on ultrasound is fluid, and we can see these uh, anechoic wedges, there it comes around again, of free fluid between these different uh, loops of bowel. Let's see, where are they? Right there. You see there's a little wedge right there of fluid. And you shouldn't ever see sharp angles Sometimes you hear people say you should never see sharp angles in nature. I don't know what that means. But um, when the loops of bowel are kind of all layering on each other with fluid surrounding them, you see the fluid between the loops of bowel that looks like a sharp angle. That's what it looks like on ultrasound. So sharp angles of free fluid wedging out between the loops of bowel um, portends a pretty bad prognosis, or at least if the patient has a, probably a perforation of their bowel. And so this is a surgical emergency. Um, now, there's another example here of small bowel obstruction, and we can see the plicae circularis uh, up there uh, seen going across this loop here. A pretty dilated loop of small bowel, the plicae, and there's also fluid between these two different loops here next to one another. There's fluid surrounding it, which tells us there's probably been perforation. We're going to switch gears now and talk about appendicitis. This issue of appendicitis comes up every single day in my emergency department. Because, uh, number one, it's the most surgical, it's the most common surgical abdominal emergency in North America. About 7% of the population ultimately gets appendicitis. Okay, raise your hand if you've had appendicitis. More people will get it. <laughs> Only one person. That's pretty cool. Um, 
so that's good. Maybe somebody else in this room, you can diagnose each other upstairs on the third floor after this lecture. Uh, basically, the problem with appendicitis is that you think that people come in like they've read the textbook. Okay, so first of all, doctor, I had pain around my belly button area, and then, boy, I started to feel a lot of nausea, and uh, I felt some like chills and some fevers. Then, next thing I know, the pain migrated to my right lower quadrant. <laughs> I looked up the internet, it's called McBurney's Point, and when I push on it, it's like my belly really hurts. I lift my leg up and twist it around. That makes it worse, right? So, but unfortunately, that only happens about a third of the time or something, right? So, um, actually, probably about 50% of the time, people say, there's something funky about the history that just lures you away from appendicitis. Like you walk in the room and the person is eating Cheetos. And you're like, hmm, <laughs> eating Cheetos? I don't think this patient has appendicitis, Dr. Fox. I'm like, eh, I've seen it many times. So um, how, and that's where imaging in general, that's where medical imaging kind of brings us, pulls the reins in. Sometimes if the history, the physical exam is leading us astray or, or not, you know, maybe trying to trick us one way or the other, imaging can bring us, can, can kind of, rein us in a little bit as clinicians. And, and um, ultrasound is not as good as CT scan for appendicitis, uh, but it's okay. It's the sensitivity is maybe 86%, specificity 81% after a meta-analysis a number of years ago. Um, and these, this was in the hands of sonographers and um, showing the image to radiologists. Now, going forward in the future, um, I think ultrasound in the hands of the clinician, the person that's actually evaluating the patient at the bedside, and knows exactly where the patient's got the pain. And sometimes I even hand the probe to the patient. I go, okay, put this where the pain is. And the patient's like, okay, and they stick it you know, right where the, and then I push down there, and then, oh, hey, there's the appendix. The patient found it for me. I think once we see that data start to get out there, I think the test characteristics will improve. In fact, other countries where ultrasound is much more accepted in the hands of the clinician, we see um, incredibly high rates of accuracy with ultrasound for appendicitis. Now, the reason that ultrasound has a poor specificity with appendicitis um, has to do with this, and that's that the um, appendix is only seen about 15% of the time, the normal appendix. I got lucky in my last shift, uh, maybe two shifts ago now, and I saw a normal appendix. It was really cool. I called a bunch of people in to see it. Because usually when you're looking for appendicitis, you think the patient's got appendicitis, you go in the room, you start compressing in the right lower quadrant, you just see a bunch of loops of bowel, and you know you push around, and you think you might see the appendix, but what it looks like when it's normal is this. It's a blind ended tubular structure that hangs off the terminal ilium. And so you, you try to start around that area, you mow the lawn down in that right lower quadrant, transverse, sagittal, trying to find that structure that you see on the screen there. So burn that image in your mind, you may not see it for a while. I think though, as you guys get really proficient with ultrasound over the next four years, if anybody's got a shot, if any clinician's got a shot at finding a normal appendix, it's going to be the people in this room. Now, when you look for the appendix, what you're doing is you're searching around for that non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant that gets sandwiched between the abdominal musculature and the psoas muscle. And you're kind of like waiting for it, and all of a sudden you get lucky, and it like pops its head out at you. And then <laughs> as fast as it does that, it's gone again. And so you end up... <laughs> You end up like, whoa, wait, did I just see it? Where's the freeze? Hit freeze. And then you can scroll back and see it again. Or you just keep compressing around, sort of looking for it, and then boom, there it is again. And then it goes away. And so there's a lot of art here, and it's very operator dependent and user dependent, you know, this kind of thing. So, but over time, you find that you do get uh, better than this, uh, better with this. And there's something called an appendicolith. An appendicolith literally means, you know, um, poop stone. It's like um, what happens is you picture the appendix hanging off the terminal ilium. It's like this little vestigial thing, like your pinky finger, and it's got you know a lumen, right? And then if a hardened turd blocks the entrance of the appendix, okay, well now fluid can't get in and out of this this appendix, and it starts to the pressure inside the lumen of the appendix starts to get higher and higher and higher, and that's what causes some of these symptoms eventually what happens? Well, the blood supply going to the appendix, can no, the, the, the blood can no longer get there because the pressure inside the lumen of the appendix is higher than the blood pressure's ability to pump the blood to the appendix. And eventually the, the appendix gets gangrenous or it gets ischemic and doesn't get enough blood and perforates. Um, people call it 
other things like the appendix explodes or ruptures, but really the word is perforation. Part of the appendix just pops open to relieve the pressure inside the appendix. So people, patients actually feel a symptom of relief at one point, and that's ominous because that probably means they perforated and now they've got bacteria and stool spilling out into their peritoneal cavity, and they can get pretty sick. 5% mortality rate once you perforate your appendix, though most of those are in patients who are greater than 65 years old. So how do you do this? Um, it's called the graded compression technique, and what you're gonna do is after you adequately arrange for the patient to have analgesia, you go in and you compress. This is the psoas muscle right here, and it's gonna come in contact with the abdominal wall musculature. And as much as I can describe this to you in a lecture, this is something that you really need stick time to get a good beat on. And we're gonna be practicing that today. You're gonna to be looking for the psoas as you push on our healthy, um, nice models who are going along with, the, with this program. So, because it's a little uncomfortable to them to be munching around in their abdomen, for the model's sake, in fact, for your patient's sake in the future, you should have the patient bend their knees, okay? Because that makes the abdomen a little more doughy and easier to uh, compress. And this is what a positive appendix looks like here coming up. This is uh, acute appendicitis. This is what happens when you compress the psoas musculature down here, and that appendix gets sandwiched between psoas and abdominal wall musculature. Notice there's some peri enteric hyperchoic area here that is um, periappendiceal inflammation. We see on ultrasound looks very hyperchoic. And they're measuring this appendix. I think it comes out to like 9.7 millimeters, which is greater than six millimeters. So it's a non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant that wall to wall, outside wall to outside wall measures more than six millimeters. And the patient lets you know too that you found their appendicitis in a very clear way as you're doing this. Sonographic Murphy signs, sometimes people call it. Not sonographic, but sonographic Murphy signs for the gallstones. Sonographic McBurney's sign is what some people call this because the McBurney's point is the location where the appendix usually lies in the right lower quadrant, which I know you guys have been studying. So this is a picture, this is kind of what happens. We're looking around for the appendix, we're compressing things, we see all these loops of bowels. Some of them are filled with fluid. Here's psoas, it comes all the way up to the skin line, or I should say to the abdominal wall musculature. The abdominal wall musculature in this part of your body is your abdominal obliques, and if you come a little bit more medially there, you can see rectus abdominal muscle. And if you cross midline, you see the rectus sheath, and then you get to the other rectus on the other side. So you can look at all that today as you're mowing the lawn of your patients of your models. Here's another case of clear uh, acute appendicitis. We can see here non-compressible tubular structure. That didn't come out right. Non-compressible <laughs> tubular structure down here in the right lower quadrant. Uh, that measures, what does it say? Moving right along, uh, I think uh, eight millimeters was that one, but this is a sausage-like structure seen down here in the right lower quadrant. Hey, I don't make up these terms, you know, they're, they're on the internet. <laughs> on, a, a, on urbandictionary.com, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So if you, <laughs> one of my favorite websites. So this is actually another example here of acute appendicitis. We can see the, the psoas muscle is down here, non-compressible tubular structure. You know, this is what it looks like, wall to wall. Notice this hypoechoic surrounding area that is the outside wall. This is what intestines look like all along your GI tract, from your esophagus all the way down to your rectum, or some people say from your rooter to your tutor, and that's how that uh, intestine looks like. It's got hypoechoic outer walls to it all the way along. That's how I always know I'm looking at bowel. This comes up all the time with the gallbladder. People go, oh, what's that thing over there? What's that mass in there? And it's just the duodenum seen on end sometimes. It can look a lot like this. It looks like any other part of the intestines. We'll get to that in a minute. So this is a patient who's got a fecal lift. You'll see that hypoechoic structure. That's a stone with a shadow behind it blocking um, this, this appendix, and that's why the patient ended up with appendicitis in the first place. So sometimes you'll, you'll have a trouble finding the appendix only to realize that there's a fecal if they're doing some uh, blocking of the sound to get to see the appendix. Okay, so just to summarize what we've been talking about so far before we move on to the next topic, normal intestinal ultrasound, which you're gonna see today, you see a nice layered appearance, easily compressible, you should see intermittent peristalsis, um, and large intestine should have a wall thickness less than four millimeters, small intestine is less than that. Moving on now to the gallbladder. Uh, this is gallbladder ultrasonography 101 that you're looking at here. What do I mean by that? Well, 
what you do is you do something called a subcostal sweep. A subcostal sweep is where you take the indicator and you aim it towards the patient's head and then you have the patient take a deep breath and as you do so, you follow it along the costal margin. Now, if you, if you just reach on yourself right now and feel your ribs where they end, right, your xiphoid process, this is, and then if you kind of stick your ribs out for a second, you can feel how your costal margin becomes a little bit more prominent when you take a deeper breath, okay? And that's what you're going to do. The patient's going to take a deep breath, and you're going to slide right along that inferior costal margin, okay? That's sort of like step one ultrasound. You should see how you guys all look right now doing that. That's sort of step one ultrasound, okay? Um, and... There's so many anechoic structures seen on the screen when you do this that sometimes you need a landmark to help you identify the thing that is the gallbladder, okay? So you know that the right and left lobes of the liver come together, and whenever two things come together on ultrasound, you see a hyperechoic line. We see it all over the body, like Morrison's pouch. The liver and the kidney come together, hyperechoic line. Um, the vaginal stripe is simply the walls of the vagina all coming together to make that hyperchoic line. Well, where the right and left lobes of the liver come together, it's called the main interlobar fissure, and it's the fossa that the gallbladder sits in, okay? And we can see the main interlobar fissure seen right here between the portal vein and the neck of the gallbladder. Another example of the main interlobar fissure is this example right here. I don't know why everybody always laughs at this. Here's the portal vein here. This is the gallbladder. And again, you're looking at an anechoic structure. like, oh, which one is the gallbladder? Well, about 75% of patients have a very prominent main interlobar fissure that you can see <laughs> connecting your portal vein up to the neck of the gallbladder. Okay? Yeah, that where you see stones. Well, you'll see stones all throughout the gallbladder, sometimes down in the neck, sometimes up in the fundus, in the body, depends how the patient's been standing or sitting because the gallstones like roll all around, okay? Now, anybody know what organ lies just posterior to the gallbladder? So in other words, if you were to take, uh, there's a plate on netter that should have up here. Um, yeah, the kidney is posterior to it, but there's another organ that gets in the way. The kidney's our friend. There's an enemy that gets in the way there, actually. If you, there's this one plate on netter where you, you take that, hook or whatever, he, he like pulls the liver back, okay, and you can see the gallbladder sitting up here in the fossa, and then you look down, like if you let go of the hook, the whole thing would crash down on what? Good, second portion of the duodenum. So that's where, that's where the air is in that duodenum getting in your way, okay, and that's always going to be the problem with the, with the gallbladder. The air in the duodenum is, fouls up your gallbladder image, okay? Now, so what you need to do is really kind of roll the patient on their left side, okay? And that will get the loops of bowels, especially the duodenum, to kind of fall out of the way the majority of the time. Now, if that doesn't work and the patient can tolerate it, you can have them drink a glass of water, come back in 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and the water will eventually make its way into the, into the duodenum, pushing out that air that was there. And now, water, the friend of ultrasound, we can see the gallbladder. Now, what you're going to hear next is a, f a prior fellow, ultrasound fellow of mine named Will Scruggs, and he's made it his life's work with ultrasound the gallbladder. So I wanted a, him to kind of, I captured him a video showing how to, the technique he uses to scan the gallbladder. Now, he's got a really funny voice. I just want to warn you, okay? <laughs> That's actually how he talks. Once you insulate the gallbladder in the long axis, you also need to uh, view it in the short axis. Uh, when you, once you do get the gallbladder in the long axis, you're going to fan through the gallbladder like so, making sure you catch the entire gallbladder, looking for any type of pathology. After you're done with the long axis, you're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees from whatever axis you're in, like so, and you're going to view the gallbladder in the short axis. Again, you're going to fan through the entirety of the gallbladder, looking for any possible pathology. So, once you go to the short axis, from the long axis, uh, this is what you see. You see things start to look like circles, and the kidney looks more round in the short axis. Remember, the indicators of the patient's right. There's this circle here, there's this circle here, we see another circle over here. Basically, what we're looking at, this is the aorta, the IVC, and the gallbladder. The way I know that that's the gallbladder, one of the ways I know, one is the 
M-I-L-F. The other way is the fact that in this axis, where I don't see the MILF, the, I can see that the gallbladder is the most anterior anechoic structure on the screen. Okay? So in other words, it's the closest thing to the skin line or the transducers. It's the closest anechoic structure to the skin line, and that's really what you're looking for. Here's some more wheel scrubs. In young thing patients, we tend to find the gallbladder more lateral and anterior. In those patients, if you can't find it with the subcostal sweep or the X-7 approach, it's often helpful to take the indicator and really flatten it out against the abdomen. The indicator is pointed towards the patient's right. Uh, the probe itself is flattened out as much as you can. You kind of uh, fan through the gallbladder anterior to posterior as you work your way laterally. And oftentimes you'll find the gallbladder up in this area here. And when you move from a thin patient like the one you see diagrammed here to a larger patient like the one you see diagrammed here, then you'll find that the gallbladder is a little more higher in the abdomen, a little more rounded, a little bit more lateral, and sometimes the only way to see a gallbladder like that in a larger patient is to go X minus 7. So X stands for the xiphoid process. 7, the number of centimeters that you're going to drag the probe laterally to the patient's right in order to see the gallbladder. Now sometimes you're X minus 10, X minus 12, you get the picture. It depends on the patient's habitus, but essentially what I'm getting at here is that you're going instead of subcostally or below the ribs, now you're going intracostally or between the ribs. In the X minus 7 approach, the X stands for the xiphoid process. The 7 stands for the 7 centimeters you're going to go to the right laterally, place the probe perpendicular to the patient's skin, and more often than not, you're going to find the gallbladder in this general area. And the funny thing about the gallbladder is that it truly will test you in terms of your artistic ability as a sonographer. What do I mean by that? Well, the gallbladder can be found in so many different places and planes and locations. It can be very elusive, um, which really makes it fun, actually, to try to you know, test yourself with it. I mean, sometimes you get a better view when you're going coronally, X minus 7. Sometimes you get it transabdominally. I mean, I should say a transverse. You get it in the transverse plane when you're maybe subxiphoid or even X minus 7 in the transverse plane. Other times, you're in a sagittal plane and uh, maybe a little bit tweaked to the patient's left slightly, you'll see it stretch out even, even better. So, you know, you kind of have to unhinge your mind a little bit here at the gallbladder. I mean, these are some of the places that you'll find it when you're going X minus 7. But, I mean, you know, in older patients, everything kind of starts to sag, and so does the gallbladder. I've seen it, like, down here. I've seen the gallbladder over here in older patients. You know, they get really kyphotic, and you can, like, find it, you know, crawling around anywhere. So, but one thing that's nice about it, it does have genuine factory parts in the sense that it's got a fundus, it's got a body, and it's got a neck. And down here in the neck, sometimes we call that Hartman's pouch. There's some twists and turns it can take, and you can follow those around using uh, ultrasound. Now, posterior to the gallbladder is what organ again? The duodenum. The duodenum. Specifically, we see here that usually it's the second portion of the duodenum, seen just behind the posterior gallbladder wall. And what's this right here? It's inside the lumen of the duodenum. Air, air, air. So air looks like this. Air, as I mentioned, can sometimes cast a dark shadow or a bright shadow. It's variable. And so, doesn't this look almost like a stone with a shadow behind it? Yeah. Okay, now, now knowing that, think about how sound, when it comes out of the probe, okay, it's actually, you think about sound being like microscopically thin, but actually the sound that comes out of the probe, it's got some thickness. So like the, in this case, this example, the thickness of my fingers is like maybe one centimeter thick. Sound is about a millimeter and a half thick. And so when you're looking directly at the gallbladder, as you get to the edge, as, you, as you're fanning through any organ, as you start to get to the organ next door, some of that sound starts to get into the organ next door to it, and it overlays that organ on top of the organ you think you're looking at which is why some people can easily mistake if they get up to the edge of this gallbladder, it starts to look like this air in this duodenum suddenly starts to look like it's superimposing over the gallbladder, and that's how a mistake can be made. And you can say, oh, there's a gallstone, when in reality it was just some air in the, in the duodenum. Now, this is what a 
fold down here in the neck of the gallbladder looks like. And when you see a fold in the neck of the gallbladder, it's called a fold in the neck of the gallbladder. It doesn't have a fancy name. <laughs> but when you see a fold up in the fundus of the gallbladder, now it's got a cool name. It's called a Phrygian cap. Okay, so we can see this Phrygian cap up here. And sometimes stones will get wedged up here. It doesn't mean anybody's, you know, has a uh, pathologic problem. It's just an, uh, a common anatomical variant of the gallbladder. And so sometimes you follow these gallbladders throughout all their folds. Just keep in mind that the concept of a gallbladder that's septated is almost impossible. In fact, I've never even seen one. People call me, the room, hey, we have a septated gallbladder. I go in there, and if I could just fan through enough, I'll find where it's confluent with the rest of itself because it's just a fold. Does that make sense? Now, gallstones themselves are cool because they're very echogenic. They're dense structures, they're echogenic, and so when sound encounters them, the sound gets attenuated and reflects back, and what results is a shadow. And so gallstones shadow, they're gravitationally dependent. As you move the patient around, the gallstones move around, okay? And for these reasons, ultrasound has very, very good test characteristics, better than CT scan for gallstones. A CT scan could miss the gallstone altogether with the cut. It happens all the time, very frequently. And so ultrasound here is really the gold standard. This is just what some gallstones look like with some shadowing here. Uh, another example here, some gallstones with some shadowing. And it's such an unbelievably common uh, disorder in our patient population at UCI Medical Center that I would say, let's see, I saw one of my senior residents. Montessa, are you still in here? <laughs> yeah, it's such a nice day out too. Montessa, how often do you think we see gallstones in our emergency department? On a, how would you describe it? Am I overselling it? Are there, am I? In a 24 hour period in our emergency department, how often do we see gallstones? Every hour, she says. Wow, yeah. I think that's possibly true, actually. It's very, very common. So. And that's why it's good to get good with this, because you'll get to use this skill quite a bit wherever you go, whether you're in an outpatient setting, whether you take this to another country, wherever you are, this is a very common ailment. So this is the same patient. We made an adjustment to the machine to get the gallstone to cast a shadow. What adjustment did we make? That's right. Some people are looking down at their iPads who've, who've downloaded Mer from Merlin. They see the lecture. And it's not gain. Everybody always says gain. And you'd think that we turned down the gain and we saw the shadow that way. I guess it's possible to overgain it so much that you could miss a shadow. But the answer is resolution mode. And so what we did was we went up with the frequency. And remember how higher frequencies can't penetrate as far? And so when you go from a low frequency to a high frequency, the sound attenuates more, and that results in the shadow being more common. And so that's all we did here is we turned up the frequency. And on the Sonocyte products, when you go from general mode to resolution mode, that's like going from you know 3 megahertz to 5 megahertz or something. It's going up on the frequency. What's it called when you go down the frequency? When you go lower, there's a term they use. It's not resolution, but it's called penetration mode. That's exactly right. So penetration mode, general mode, and resolution mode. This is an example when you go from gen to res, from general to resolution mode. You're going up on the frequency, more attenuation, more shadowing. How about this one here? This is what happens when the gallbladder contracts down on a stone. And you know, working in the ER and somebody comes to find me, hey, I can't find the gallbladder anywhere. All I see is shadows coming out of the liver. And I'm thinking to myself, sweet, this is going to be a contracted gallbladder around a bunch of stones. And I go in there, and that's exactly what I see nine times out of ten, is this. It's called a west side, and it stands for wall echo shadow. The W is the anterior wall of the gallbladder. The E is the echogenic stone, and the S is the shadow that comes out of that gallstone. So normally when the gallbladder is not contracted, when it's just like open and there's stones in there, you see all the bile, and then you see the stone, and then you see the shadow. And you can make out the walls of the gallbladder much better. The whole anatomy sort of comes to life. But when the gall, why does the gallbladder contract? CCK causes the gallbladder to contract, and then it squirts the bile into the 
and took the duodenum to dissolve the fatty meal he just ate. And so when the gallbladder contracts around a stone, all the way down around a stone, patients get like really symptomatic from that. They get a lot of what we call biliary colic. They get this colicky, crampy, severe pain in the right upper epigastric or right upper quadrant. And we go to the bedside, we see this a contracted gallbladder all the way around a stone. And all we see sometimes, it's even hard to make out the anterior gallbladder wall. You just kind of see the shadow coming out of the liver. Okay, now, for those of you looking at your iPads and can see the lecture and the answer, don't shout out just yet. Look at this image here and tell me what organ you think you're looking at. It looks like a gallbladder, right? It looks like a gallbladder filled with sludge or something, but it's not. Remember when I told you that this organ looks like this all the way from the esophagus down to the rectum? It's got this hypochoic wall to it. So this is a loop of intestine specifically. It's the duodenum. And we can see the duodenum sometimes during mid-peristalsis when it's sort of contracted down on itself. And when there's air in the duodenum casting shadows here, and that duodenum is right next to the gallbladder, it's easy to mistake a normal duodenum for having gallstones, for looking like a west sign sometimes. See the conundrum here with the gallbladder? So I bring this up and I kind of get very detailed with it because we see so much of this and it's such a part of what we're gonna, what you guys will be using it for. So I wanna make sure you understand it. So the question is what we're looking at here. This is all liver over here, okay? And we see this. How would you describe that? Is that a West sign? The person that did this ultrasound is like, is this a West? And that's why they're, they're doing that. Um, <laughs> kind of funny, actually. But it's not a West sign, is it? It's the duodenum. So air in the duodenum causes these bright and dark shadows. The bright ones are specifically called comet tail artifacts. The dark ones are just called dirty shadows. And we can see this is just air in the duodenum. But it looks a heck of a lot like a West sign. Therein lies the conundrum. This is actually a true West sign here. We see a contracted gallbladder around a whole bunch of stones, actually. And those collective stones together cause this big fat shadow to be coming out of the liver. And when you have ascites, remember I told you the liver stops working and then the fluid starts to third space or leak out of the blood vessels into the peritoneal cavity? That's called ascites. When you have ascites, it starts to like leach into the gallbladder wall. And, and almost always, patients with ascites have these very thickened gallbladder walls. A normal gallbladder wall should be less than three millimeters thick. This is what it looks like when you've got some liver tumors. You can see these very hyperchoic structures with maybe some complex nature to part of them. These sort of have a little complex nature down here. This is a patient, if you ever went through somebody's liver and you saw these hyperchoic balls in there, I'd want you to definitely be very concerned about that. That's what a liver tumor looks like. We'll talk a lot more about that next year, but I just wanted to kind of bring this up right away so you can see that this liver doesn't have this nice isochoic homogeneous contexture. Rather, it has this, these hyperchoic areas that really jump off the screen at you. Now, once you master the, the gallbladder, you can move on to the biliary tree, and you've got the portal triad, which I know you guys have been studying this week. The portal triad, as you recall, is the portal vein right here, the common bile duct, and the hepatic artery. Now, as I've tried to draw this, if you notice that the portal vein and the common bile duct, they run really parallel to one another, uh, whereas the hepatic artery kind of, kind of meanders along and sort of comes and goes. Um, but I can tell you that the, the common bile duct is very reliably anterior to the portal vein, and it should be less than six millimeters along its length. Again, these numbers we're going to all come back to next year, but I just want to throw these out here now. A CBD, and by the way, the, the, the abbreviation CBD is something I constantly use for some reason, so just sort of be aware of that. Common bile duct is CBD. Now, this is what it looks like. We can see there that the portal vein is filling with some power flow, and anterior to that portal vein is that little sliver up there is the common bile duct. I'm just going to back it up a little bit so you can see this without the flow on it. So this is the portal vein right here, and that structure just anterior to it, we're gonna find it in our models, is the common bile duct, okay? So I just put some power flow on there, so just so you could see, like, the thing that lights up is the blood vessel, and know 
the Doppler, the color will not pick up bile. The color was really designed to pick up the specular reflector that is a red blood cell. That's what it's really designed to pick up. The Doppler shift in frequencies of a moving red blood cell as it comes towards the probe and then away from the probe. And it represents, in this case, as an orange color. Even when the gallbladder is contracting, the bile doesn't get picked up by the, um, by the Doppler. It's more like little molecules and stuff. and I don't know what you call them. Chylomicrons or something. I can't remember anymore. But it, 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 they're not big enough to get picked up by the ultrasound. This is another example here of a large common bile duct. This is the portal vein seen right here. It's got, notice that the portal vein's got very thick hyperchoic walls to it. And then you go anterior to the portal vein, and this is the common bile duct up here. And then we can see kind of staring back at us right there, that little circle and the short axis, that's hepatic artery. So we're seeing this, this is the portal triad right here, it's just looking right back at us. Anybody want to take a stab at what this is down here? Good, IVC, exactly. So as this video goes along, we kind of zoom in, and then just for fun, we throw some flow on this stuff. And this is the aorta actually right here, IVC. This is left renal vein coming over and dumping into IVC, just right on top of the aorta. But what I want you to focus on right now is the portal vein, which is over here, anterior to it that does not have any flow in it here, is the common bile duct. This was hepatic artery right And one more time walking through these structures. What's this down here? IVC, seen in this case the short axis. Anybody want to take a guess what this is, this hyperchoic thing over here? Runs along the edge of the, um, the liver. It's a very thick, curved organ, hyperchoic diaphragm, exactly. Just a little piece of the diaphragm right there. That's okay. You, this, this stuff will start to take shape. Um, so this is all the liver here. So what vessel is up here this, with the hypercoke walls? Portal vein. And then what, what runs uh, anterior to the portal vein? Common bile duct, exactly right. In this case, this patient's got a whole bunch of dilated biliary ducts. You can make out these biliary ducts trying to drain into this dilated common bile duct. Normally, the common bile duct should be less than six millimeters in diameter. Portal veins typically are about a centimeter. That's how I know I'm looking at the portal veins. They're usually about a centimeter thickness. So when the common bile duct approximates the size of the portal vein, just eyeballing it, I immediately know there's a problem. There's some obstruction of this common bile duct. Because you can get a stone blocking that distal common bile duct where it's trying to drain into the uh, duodenum. It can either get stuck in the head of the pancreas from a tumor in the head of the pancreas, or there can be a, a stone that blocks this common bile duct, causing it to dilate out. So in summary, I think the best way to think about the gallbladder is have the patient take a deep breath. First thing I do, take a deep breath and hold it. Respire profundo. And that's the other thing. You're going to learn a lot of medical Spanish from me as we go through this ultrasound stuff. I'm not just about ultrasound. I'm also about medical Spanish and the way not to pronounce it. You're going to roll the patient left lateral decubitus. And uh, sometimes you get that duodenum to fall out of the way. X minus 7 in larger patients. And you want to in order to get between the ribs, if you were using a large curvilinear footprint, now you want to switch to a small footprint like a microconvex, or in the case of the probes you guys have, that P21 is perfect for getting between the ribs. Duodenal air can sometimes look like gallstones, and when you can't find the gallbladder, start to wonder about a contracted gallbladder around a stone or the wall echo shadow sign. And whenever you're looking for the common bile duct, look anterior to the portal vein, and you should get lucky. Now today I want you to try to really focus on the area where you think you'd see the appendix. Okay, we're not going to mow the entire lawn of the abdomen, but I want you to get down that right lower quadrant, compress in the transverse view, in the sagittal view, and um, try to see if you can see the psoas muscle coming up and coming in contact with the abdominal wall musculature. That's your goal today there. Look at the gallbladder in its long and short axis, and then make sure you identify the common bile duct. Oh, you're welcome.